Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. And by the Colchester Curry House, helping people make authentic Indian cuisine from the comfort of their home. Find authentic Indian spice blends and recipes at colchestercurryhouse.com. Previously on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. You're listening to Episode 1 of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries, both supernatural and natural. In this episode, we'll be talking about ghosts. I think what's fair to say is that a lot of reports of ghostly activity do have natural explanations. And so uh, the bottom line for me is that ghosts are real and we should be open to reports of ghostly activity, but we should also take a critical approach to them and exercise critical thinking and say, are there other possible explanations here? You're listening to episode 137 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about mediums, channelers, and talking with the dead. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Be sure to stay around to the end of the episode, folks, as we'll have your feedback on our recent episode on Carlos Castaneda. Ever since the fall of man, human beings have been subject to death. That means we've been losing friends and loved ones all that time. But it's hard to lose someone close to you and think that you'll never get to speak to them again in this life. That's why, throughout the ages, people have sought contact with the dead. One of the most popular ways people have tried is consulting people specially trained in contacting the deceased. They've been called by many names, including necromancers, mediums, and channelers. In recent years, they've even become the subject of scientific parapsychological studies. Can they really contact the dead? Should we trust them? And what does the Bible say about what they're doing? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. The story of the Fox sisters was big news in upstate New York and even the surrounding states. It grew to national, even international quality, thanks largely to that master showman, Phineas Taylor Barnum. P.T. Barnum read and enjoyed news accounts of the Fox sisters' amazing powers. He also realized that the girls were wasted in the upstate sticks. They belonged in his American Museum, a marble showcase on Lower Broadway, emblazoned with brilliant flags, packed with 600,000 live and dead curiosities. Stuffed lions to living fortune tellers, two-headed men to dancing midgets. The two younger Fox sisters were the attraction. Brown-haired girls from the country, chubby Maggie with her big dark eyes and round face, and skinny little Katie with her sharp, bird-like features and restless hands. They were shy, barely educated, simply dressed in their neat dark dresses and white collars. But Barnum was sure visitors would pay to sit down with daughters who talked to the dead. Regular admission to the American Museum was 25 cents. To converse with ghosts, people might pay a full dollar. They might even pay two dollars. Is the person I inquire about a relative? Two knocks for yes. A near relative? Yes. A man? No answer, meaning no. A woman? Yes. A daughter? A mother? A wife? No answer. A sister? Yes. The questioner was the novelist James Fenimore Cooper, author of the sprawling American epic, The Last of the Mohicans, He had come to visit the Fox sisters at Barnum's place, along with other luminaries, including newspaper man Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, the poet William Cullen Bryant, and Nathaniel Talmadge, former governor of Wisconsin. How long ago had his sister died? Fifty raps sounded, one for each year. Had she died of illness? No answer. An accident? Yes. 
Was she killed by lightning? Was she shot? Did she fall from a carriage? Was she lost at sea? No answer, no answer, no answer, no answer. Was she thrown by a horse? Two knocks. Yes, definitely. After he left, Cooper told his companions that every answer had been correct. He had been thinking about his sister who, 50 years ago that month, had been killed when her horse threw her. Cooper decided not to return. He was spooked. This account was taken from Deborah Bloom's book, Ghost Hunters, William James and the Search for Scientific Proof of Life After Death. The incident took place around 1850 at P.T. Barnum's American Museum in Lower Manhattan in New York. The Fox sisters, who were famous mediums at the time, were apparently able to identify the person that author James Fenimore Cooper was thinking about by means of their contacts in the spirit world. The Fox sisters knew that it was his sister. They knew that she had died in an accident when she was thrown by a horse 50 years earlier, around 1800. But Cooper hadn't told them anything about the person, and he could have been thinking about anyone in the world who had ever died and thus might be found in the spirit world. So he was impressed. And so were a lot of other people. There was intense interest both in the Fox sisters and in mediums in general in the second half of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. There's still interest in mediums today, so that's what we'll be talking about on today's show. So, Jimmy, why did you want to do this episode? There are a lot of interesting stories to tell on this topic. This includes the stories of individual mediums, of people who went to mediums, and of the parapsychologists who have studied mediums. We'll be looking at some of those stories in future episodes, so I wanted to create a keystone episode where we evaluate the overall phenomenon of mediumship. That way, in future episodes, we can focus on the interesting things that happened in individual cases, and we won't have to do an extensive analysis of the phenomenon itself every time. By doing the main analysis here, I'll be able to briefly mention our conclusions from the faith and reason perspectives and refer listeners back to this episode. That'll make for more interesting storytelling in the future with some individual analysis of the particular cases. So every field has its own special vocabulary. To get grounded in this subject, let's look at the terminology that's connected with mediumship. What terms do we need to know? Some of the terms have to do with the people who make contact with the dead. Historically, some of them have been called necromancers. This is derived from Greek roots. Necros means a dead person or a body, and mantea is a means of divination or gaining an oracle. So a necromancer is a person who contacts the dead for purposes of getting information out of them to get an oracle from the dead. Another term for this type of person is medium. This one comes from Latin. In Latin, the word medium means in the middle. So a medium is a person who's in the middle between the world of the living and the world of the dead. A medium is able to exchange messages between both of them. This is the term that was most common for people who claim to communicate with the dead in the 19th and 20th centuries. But in more recent years, another term has become common. In the final decades of the 20th century, people who served as mediums came to be called channelers. The idea was that they served as channels connecting the world of the spirits to our world. And if they went into a trance to do that, they would be called trance channelers. However, the older terminology has survived, and in this episode, we'll principally be using the term medium for people who talk with the dead. Even within this term, though, there are some distinctions that need to be made. A key one is the difference between physical and mental mediums. This distinction uh, was drawn in the 19th century when parapsychologists began doing studies on the mediums of their day. Mental mediums are those who make mental contact with the dead and speak on their behalf. Physical mediums not only made mental contact with the dead, they also had the dead physically manifest in their presence. That's why they're called physical mediums. This could include manifestations like making noises, speaking directly in an audible voice apart from the medium, displaying lights, moving objects, and even materializing objects out of thin air. 
The Fox sisters, who we heard about earlier, were physical mediums, as the spirits would produce audible noises, the knocks or raps that they used to answer questions, even though the sisters themselves didn't appear to knock or rap anything. They just sit there and let the spirits make the noises. So, all right, let's put ourselves in a 19th century context when a lot of parapsychological research was being done. Suppose a researcher was sitting down with a medium for a seance. What terms do we need to know? An obvious term is the word seance itself. This term refers to an occasion when a medium would help people contact the dead. The word comes to us from the French language, and it's ultimately derived from the Latin verb sedere, which means to sit. A seance is thus a sitting, which is so named because people would sit down for the session. Unsurprisingly, many English speakers decided to skip the fancy French word and simply refer to seances as sittings. So you'll hear an attempt to contact the dead also referred to as a sitting. The people who come to the medium for this purpose are therefore commonly called sitters. Very frequently, the medium has a special kind of spirit that she was in contact with. This kind of spirit is known as a control. A control spirit is one that the medium is regularly in contact with who serves as her guide to the spirit world. Often during a seance or sitting, the medium would contact the control first, and then the control would help contact any of the particular spirits that the sitters wanted to talk to. The control thus served as a kind of counterpart to the medium. In the physical world, the medium would serve to coordinate the sitters who wanted to speak with the dead. And on the other side, in the spirit world, the control would serve to coordinate the spirits that the sitters wanted to talk to. Because the control served as a guide to the spirit world, the control spirit also has frequently been referred to as a spirit guide. Now, in the physical world, a random person could, you know, just happen to show up at a seance, even if he wasn't one of the intended sitters. And the same thing could happen in the spirit world. Such random spirits who just happened to show up were known as drop-ins because they happened to simply drop in on the seance, even though they weren't invited. Seance crashers. (laughs) Yeah. So how did the history of mediumship unfold? As we said at the opening, people have been losing loved ones to death ever since the fall of man, and they've wanted to find ways to communicate with them. As a result, there have been people all the way down through history who have held themselves forth as individuals who can contact the dead. And they're certainly mentioned in the Bible. For example, Deuteronomy 18 famously says not to use such people. After biblical times, mediums continued to be found in cultures all over the world, and this included Christian cultures, although in the Middle Ages, mediums largely operated underground because the church followed the biblical prohibition on them. So then why was there a resurgence of mediumship in the 19th century? After the Enlightenment weakened the role of the Christian faith in Europe, mediums came more out into the open. And in the 1840s, the Fox sisters in New York and there are actually three sisters, not just the two we heard about above, began serving as mediums, and this kicked off an enormous wave of interest in the phenomenon. We'll talk about the Fox sisters in a future episode, but suffice it to say that the spiritualist movement that they inspired lasted almost a century. And now that the scientific revolution had begun, it prompted the first scientific studies of mediumship and contact with the dead. In particular, it led to the founding of two organizations, the British Society for Psychical Research and its counterpart in the United States, the American Society for Psychical Research. Both of these are very important organizations that we'll be talking about in future episodes. In fact, we've already mentioned the American Society in episodes 102 and 103 on remote viewing because it was the American Society for Psychical Research that first investigated the psychic Ingo Swan, who pioneered remote viewing. How prestigious were the scientists and researchers who participated in the studies for these organizations? They included very famous and eminent scientists, including individuals like Alfred Lord Wallace, who, with Charles Darwin, co-discovered evolution by natural selection, Lord Rayleigh, the physicist who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the element argon, he also 
was the first person in history to figure out why the sky is blue. It's because blue light has a shorter wavelength, making it more likely to hit the gas molecules in the sky, causing it to scatter so that the sky has this diffuse blue glow during the daytime. This is now known as Rayleigh scattering, named after him. The societies also included Sir William Crookes, the chemist who was the first to find helium on Earth and who discovered the element thallium, Sir Oliver Lodge, a physicist who pioneered early radio, including remote control by radio and who won numerous awards, the American William James, who was a physician, philosopher, and founder of modern psychology, Madame Marie Curie, the physicist who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for formulating the concept of radioactivity, a term that she coined, and who also won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering the elements radium and polonium. And also Charles Richet, a French doctor and physiologist who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for identifying the severe allergic reaction known as anaphylaxis. So if you or someone you love has ever had a severe allergic reaction to a bee sting or a drug and been saved by an injection or by an EpiPen, you can thank this guy. The Society for Psychical Research thus involved a bunch of scientific heavy hitters. What areas was the British Society for Psychical Research investigating? They investigated a lot of phenomena, including hypnosis, apparitions of the dead and dying, ghosts, and telepathy. In fact, the word telepathy was coined by a member of the society. One key question that the society was interested in investigating is what's referred to as the survival hypothesis. As the name would suggest, the survival hypothesis is the hypothesis that something more than mere matter survives the death of the human body. A personality or a soul can continue. One of the ways they sought to prove the survival hypothesis was by appealing to data that they got from studying mediums. I mean, after all, if you can show that a medium has information that didn't come from a living human being, that could be evidence she got it from a spirit. And if she got it from a deceased human spirit, that would be evidence that human spirits survive death. I notice that you often refer to mediums as she. Why is that? Most mediums in recent times have been female. This may have been different in other times and cultures, but recently, and especially in the 19th century and subsequently, mediums have most often been women. So as a result, I may refer to them sometimes as she. But that by no means implies that they're all women. In fact, in a future episode, we'll be focusing on one of the most famous male mediums of all time, Daniel Douglas Hume, who some have considered to be the greatest physical medium ever. How have studies of mediumship progressed since the Society for Psychical Research was first founded? Physical mediums are much less prominent today, so in this episode we'll be talking about mental mediumship. We'll cover physical mediums in future episodes. The wave of interest in mediumship that the Fox sisters began lasted almost a century, but it eventually petered out in the 1930s. There were still mediums, of course, but not nearly as many as there had been formerly, or at least not many that were as famous. The occult revival in the 1960s and 70s, though, caused some interest in mediumship with authors like Jane Roberts and her Seth material attracting attention. In the 1980s and 90s, Jay-Z Knight and her spirit guide Ramtha became famous with Knight being known as a trance channeler. The 1990s also saw the emergence of James Van Prague as a medium. And in the 2000s, John Edward became a famous medium. All of these people were operating on the popular level, but scientific studies of mediumship were still going on in the academic world. There was a particular resurgence of studies after the year 2000, and this is currently an active area of research in parapsychology. We'll move on to the theories about mediumship in just a minute, but first I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make the show possible, including Samuel L., Kenneth P., Kevin G., Robert C. and Colin H. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. 
thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter. When you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So, for example, if you become a new patron at $10 a month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all our shows, including this one, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking about becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. And by Colchester Curry House, helping people make authentic Indian cuisine from the comfort of their own home. Find authentic Indian spice blends and recipes at colchestercurryhouse.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about mediums and the information that they provide for sitters? Well, uh, there are two basic classes of explanations, and these divide based on whether there is a natural explanation for the information or whether there's a paranormal explanation for the information. Natural explanations for the information that mediums come up with uh, when it's true, uh, when the information is accurate, it could be due to random chance. It also could be due to conscious fraud. It could be due to unconscious fraud, on the other hand. And then on the paranormal side, if they're not getting the information through a normal means, well, it would be a paranormal means, but there are several possibilities. The one that mediums claim to be getting it from is human souls. So we're talking to a dead person on the other side, and they're giving us this information that they happen to know. On the other hand, human spirits aren't necessarily the only ones out there. And so another hypothesis that can be certainly can be proposed is they're getting it from demons. And then there is the possibility that they're not getting it from a departed soul or a demon or a spirit of any kind. They're getting it themselves by means of psychic abilities. So we'll need to consider each one of those. Let's start from the faith perspective. What can we say about mediumship from the faith perspective? From a perspective of Catholic faith, we can say, don't do it. Don't be a medium and don't use mediums. This is explicitly forbidden in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 18, we read, When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, a soothsayer or an augur, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess give heed to soothsayers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you so to do. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brethren. Him you shall heed. In this passage, God indicates that a variety of Canaanite practices were not to be used by the Israelites. A key purpose of these practices was getting information from the dead. And God indicated that the Israelites were to get their supernatural information in another way. God would send them prophets. Therefore, they didn't need to and shouldn't make use of these other means of getting information from the supernatural world. Necromancy is forbidden today as well. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states in paragraph 2116, All forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. So don't try to summon spirits, whether human or non-human, for purposes of getting information out of them. How does that relate to asking the saints for their intercession? It doesn't. They're not the same thing. When we ask the saints to be our prayer partners in heaven, we're not getting information out of them. We're giving information to them, namely the fact that we'd like them to pray to God alongside of us. So that's really the opposite of necromancy, which is why there are no biblical passages that forbid it. 
Does the fact that the Bible and the faith forbid necromancy mean that it never works? No, it doesn't mean that. A lot of things are forbidden, but still take place in reality. I mean, murder and adultery are forbidden, but that doesn't mean that murders and adulteries don't take place in reality. In the same way, contacting the dead is forbidden, but that doesn't mean contacting the dead never takes place in reality. The Bible says don't use necromancy, but it doesn't say it never works. In fact, we know of at least one case in the Bible where it does. If you read 1 Samuel 28, it recounts how King Saul was desperate to get some information from the Lord about an upcoming battle with the Philistines. But the Lord wasn't answering him by the conventional means, such as by prophets. So Saul went to a medium, the famous Witch of Endor, and asked her to summon the soul of the dead prophet Samuel so he could get the information he wanted. She did, and Samuel gave it to him, also, though, mentioning that he would lose the battle and die for having disobeyed the Lord on previous occasions. Haven't some suggested that it was really a demon who appeared to the medium and not really the spirit of Samuel? Yes, but that's not what the biblical text says. The text speaks of the spirit straightforwardly as Samuel and doesn't say anything about a demon. So that's reading into the text rather than reading what the text actually says. Furthermore, if you read Sirach 4620, it confirms that it was Samuel. That text says, Even after Samuel had fallen asleep, he prophesied and revealed to the king his death and lifted up his voice out of the earth in prophecy to blot out the wickedness of the people. So just because trying to call up the dead through a medium is forbidden doesn't mean that God never allows it to happen. We'll have more to say about this later because I want to come back to the faith perspective after we've looked at the reason perspective. All right, let's do that now. What can we say about mediumship from the reason perspective? What about the information that mediums come up with allegedly from discarnate human souls? The first thing to say is that a lot of the supposed information they come up with is incorrect, or else it's so general that it fits almost everyone. Ordinary, low-quality mediums don't have a particularly high accuracy rate. This does not mean that all of the information obtained by mediumship is false. In fact, some of it is true, sometimes startlingly so. Like in our opening story, where two of the Fox sisters were able to correctly identify the departed spirit that James Fenimore Cooper was thinking about, including how long ago she died and how she died. This was very impressive and not the kind of thing you'd expect to happen by random chance. So here... In this episode, we won't really be interested in amateur mediums who like just do it for fun at parties or community fairs or things like that. Instead, we'll be focusing on mediums who have submitted themselves for scientific investigation. One of the proposed naturalistic explanations for the information they came up with is conscious fraud. How common is that? Extremely common, especially among professional mediums who would hold public seances as a means of making money. We'll cover this in future episodes, and it it was obvious in the 19th century, and the founders of the British and American Societies for Psychical Research were all over this. At times, the papers they were writing consisted of one bust after another of professional mediums, exposing them as frauds. This led to a general conclusion that they should focus their research efforts away from the big, showy professional mediums who were making money. A lot of the tricks that they used were essentially the same things that stage magicians do. This was particularly the case with the physical mediums, who borrowed tricks from stage magic to make sounds, voices, lights, and physical objects seem to appear out of nowhere. It also was the case with mental mediums, who were doing things to get information about the sitters that are essentially the same kind of techniques that are used by mentalist magicians today. Two of these techniques were known as cold reading and hot reading. 
Cold reading is when the medium doesn't know anything about the sitters in advance, but is able to deduce information and make high probability guesses about them by reading their body language, the way they talk, their age, their gender, their clothing, their hairstyle, and so forth. This information is then attributed to the spirits telling them these things when really it's all deduction and guesswork from the way the sitters present themselves and and what they tell the medium. Hot reading is when the medium has done research in advance of the seance and deliberately learned about the sitters. They would often target people who were planning on attending the seance, and then they'd use assistants who weren't known to the sitters to do the actual research. Back in 1938, stage magician John Mulholland described how the research could be conducted. Where do the mediums get the information? It's very easy. Look the person up in a telephone book. Talk to the corner grocer. Go to the house and try to sell a magazine subscription. Talk to the neighbors. Talk to the servants if there are any. If it's a small city, go to the cemetery and look at the tombstones. It has to be done carefully, but it's very easy. The mediums even started networking to pool what they had learned about frequent sitters, which would then be published in uh, privately circulated works known as Blue Books. British historian Ruth Brandon states, There were a number of recognized methods in use. Some were very down to earth. When a medium visited a new town, he was advised to visit the local cemetery and to make a note of names, dates, and any other information to be obtained from the tombstones. He might also consult the Blue Book for the area, a compilation circulated among mediums listing, for an increasing number of places, the names of leading spiritualists likely to attend seances, with descriptions, family histories and details, deceased spouses, children, parents, etc., and other information likely to be of use. So there was a lot of conscious fraud, especially among the flashy professional mediums who were making money. You mentioned that some cases might be explained by unconscious fraud. What did you mean by that? The phrase unconscious fraud can be a little confusing since fraud normally means deliberate deception, but this term is used in some circles, and in those cases, it refers to situations where a person is deceiving others without being conscious of this fact. One of the classic examples is of a medium who thinks that he is in communication with a spirit and convinces others that he is, when really he's not. So he's not deliberately trying to deceive them. Instead, he's deceiving both himself and them about where the information is coming from. How would unconscious fraud work in mediumship? One way that we've already mentioned is random chance. Uh, a person may imagine that a spirit is telling them something, and the information may be correct purely by random chance. Another possibility is cryptoamnesia, which is where you've learned something in the past but have forgotten about it. For example, suppose that you're a medium who has been asked to get in contact with the spirit of someone who spoke another language, well, let's say German. You're then asked to get some German words from the spirit to prove you're in contact with someone who speaks German. It could be that you learned a bit of German years ago but you've forgotten it, you know, maybe by watching World War II movies or something. In that case, your subconscious might cough up some of the needed German words without you remembering where you got them. So you attribute them to the spirit and you think you're in contact with the spirit who speaks German. A third possibility is unintentional cold reading. If you're a medium and you're being asked questions by a sitter, you're likely to be very attentive to what the sitter is asking you. After all, you know, you don't want to appear foolish in front of them. So if he's unintentionally throwing off clues about the answers, you might unconsciously or semi-consciously pick up on those clues and they could guide your answers. Well, let's suppose your sitter is asking, did my dead wife like Chinese food? And at the same time he's asking the question, he's nodding his head up and down in hopes you'll answer, yes, she loved it, because he wants to believe you're really in contact with her. Even if the head movement is very slight, you might pick up on it, and that could give you a little extra push that you need to say, oh, yes, of course, she liked Chinese food very much. 
In 2004, former New Ager Carla McLaren wrote an article in which she looked back on her time as a medium and realized a good bit of what she was doing was subconscious cold reading. She concluded at the time that she was getting information from spirits, but in hindsight, she realized it was information she was picking up from the sitters and misattributing to the spirits. So there are multiple ways that a medium who is only imagining that she's in contact with a spirit could unintentionally deceive people who are asking her questions. One of the key goals of parapsychological researchers, therefore, is to do experiments that eliminate the possibility of both cold and hot reading. And how do they do that? By blinding both the mediums and the sitters to each other. In other words, the mediums do not know who the sitters are at all, not even their names, so they can't research them in advance and do hot readings on them. And the sitters are not present for the reading, meaning that they can't unintentionally give off clues that the mediums could use to do a cold reading. In fact, recent experiments have gone way beyond this and have involved as many as five levels of masking, resulting in quintuple blind experiments. It's not very well known, but this is one of the ways in which parapsychologists have turned out to be leaders in refining scientific method. Their field of study gets so much criticism and has to face so many objections that some parapsychologists have actually become pioneers in conducting tests that are even more strict than those used by regular scientists. And these techniques can then spill back into the normal scientific community. So even though they don't usually get credit for it, parapsychologists actually have been pushing the scientific method forward, helping it become more rigorous. How does such a multiple blind experiment work? One example is a study that was published in 2007 by Julie Beichel and Gary Schwartz. According to the textbook, Parapsychology, a Handbook for the 21st Century, here's how the experiment worked. Eight mediums each provided phone readings for two deceased individuals, and each absent sitter then scored one target and one decoy reading. The high level of masking in the study has been called full, complete, triple or quintuple, and is now referred to as more than double. Here's how the blinding worked in this experiment. Here's the first layer of blinding. One, mediums were masked to the identities of the discarnates and the sitters. So the medium neither knew the identity of any of the sitters or the identities of the departed souls they wanted to ask about. Two, sitters did not know which of the two readings they were given to rate was the reading meant for them. In other words, after the reading was over, the sitters were given two transcripts. One was a transcript of what the medium actually said for the sitter in question, and the other was a transcript of a decoy reading that was actually given for a different sitter in the study. They then asked the sitter to identify which reading best described their departed loved one, and they didn't know you know, which was which. So it was an honest choice of which one better, which one of these two better describes the person you were wanting to contact. Three, research assistants who collected descriptions of the discarnates used for reading pairing were unaware of which discarnate was being read by which medium or for whom the resulting reading was intended. So the research assistants didn't know which departed soul was the target of which medium or which sitter had requested the reading on that soul. 4. The experimenter did not know the details about the discarnate whose first name she gave the medium during the phone reading in which she was the proxy. The overall experimenter who tasked the mediums thus didn't know anything but the first names of the target souls. And 5. When the sitters came into the laboratory to rate the readings, the experimenter did not know which of the readings was that sitter's target. So when the sitters came in... To evaluate their readings, the experimenter still did not know which readings were real and which were the decoys, so the experimenter couldn't unintentionally influence the choices that the sitters would make. This is way beyond a conventional double-blind experiment. In this experiment, the mediums did know one piece of information about the souls to be contacted, their first names. Couldn't that give them some information? 
A little. Uh, it typically would let you know the gender of the target, at least for most names. But, you know, there's always it's Pat. Robin. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> uh, and since baby names come and go, you know, they come into and go out of fashion, it could tell them something about when the target was born. For example, the name Max was common in the early 20th century, but then it fell out of use until very recently. As a result, if you meet someone named Max, he's likely to be either very old or very young. I was reading one book on linguistics, which covers the phenomenon of baby name popularity, and it said if you meet a Max, he's likely to either be in a nursing home or a nursery school. <laughs> um, names also frequently contain information about what cultural group a person belongs to. You know, if someone is named Jesus, he's likely Hispanic. And if he's named Chen, he or she is likely Chinese because Chen can go for either gender in Chinese. So there is information that can be gleaned from knowing someone's first name, but the experimenters tried to control for that by asking the mediums information that could not be guessed based just upon a name. Here's what they say. The primary criticism of this protocol is that first names of discarnates are given to the mediums. Although this step is required in order to provide the medium with a target for the mental focus necessary to perform readings under masked conditions, as well as required for the pairing of readings necessary for radar masking, it has been proposed, primarily in non-academic forums, that the name alone can provide the medium with enough information to create accurate readings. However, the protocol requires the medium to provide specific information in response to experimenter questions regarding the discarnate's physical appearance, personality, interests, and cause of death. The names do not appear to provide enough information to effectively answer each of these questions. And I agree with that. First names do not let you guess things like a person's physical appearance, their personality, their hobbies, or what they died from. However, I think that if future experimenters want to avoid this objection, they could borrow a technique from remote viewing so that the mediums wouldn't even be given a first name, just a target number like target 54326. Remote viewers allegedly are able to lock on to the target even when it's masked by a random number, and mediums might be able to also. What results did the study come up with? The results of modern scientific studies are often presented in a statistical format that's difficult to parse if you haven't had training in statistics, so I'll spare you some of the more technical details. However, the bottom line is that the sitters correctly identified which reading concerned their departed loved one, and they rejected the decoy reading 81% of the time. For the more statistically inclined, the study's results had a p-value of 0 0.007, which means that the chance of getting such results by random chance would be expected to happen only seven times if you ran the experiment a thousand times. So a seven in 1,000 probability of explaining these results just by chance. The experiment also showed an effect size in the scoring of the actual readings from the decoy readings of 0.5, which is a respectable effect size. We'll also have a link to the original paper so that the statistically inclined listeners can read it in all of its statistical finery. Here is how the researchers summarized their conclusions. The results suggest that certain mediums can anomalously receive accurate information about deceased individuals. The study design effectively eliminates conventional mechanisms as well as telepathy as explanations for the information reception, but the results cannot distinguish among alternative paranormal hypotheses such as survival of consciousness, the continued existence separate from the body of an individual's consciousness or personality after physical death, and super psi, or super ESP, retrieval of information via a psychic channel or quantum field. A key fact is that this study was subsequently replicated in 2015 with a significantly larger study that got similar results. And as you know, replication is a very important factor in modern science. 
For an overview of recent scientific studies on mediumship, you can read the chapter on mental mediumship in the textbook Parapsychology, a Handbook for the 21st Century. The experimenters we just mentioned said they found evidence that some mediums can get information from paranormal sources about deceased loved ones, but they admitted that they couldn't distinguish what source the information was coming from. What about the idea that it could be due to psychic abilities? Whether you think this is possible will depend on whether you think psychic abilities are possible. Just by way of refresher, the idea is that psychic abilities are thought to be relatively weak, but still natural human abilities, ones that God built into human nature. And for more information on that, you can listen to episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science. The idea is that God built these abilities, I mean, from a Christian perspective, the idea would be that God built these abilities into human nature, which is why they're natural. But if they exist, the question is why they're so weak. One proposed explanation is that they would have been much stronger if man had never fallen into sin, and that they're remnants of gifts that God meant us to have, but that were then damaged by sin. This view is explored by Father Alois Weisinger in his 1957 book, Occult Phenomena in Light of Theology. Uh, we'll have a link to where you can get a copy of that book and read it for yourself. And by the way, it has a pre-Vatican II imprimatur, if that means something to you. Does the idea of psychic abilities have a place in the history of Catholic thought? The modern sense of of the term psychic is recent, but the idea that humans have weak natural abilities like this has a long history. St. Augustine took seriously the possibility that our souls may have a limited natural ability to get information about the future or what we today would call precognition. He talks about it, for example, in his book On the Literal Interpretation of Genesis, Book 12, Chapter 13, if you want to look it up. St. Thomas Aquinas also held that we have a weak natural ability from natural causes to do precognition, which he referred to as natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. He talks about it, for example, in the Summa Theologiae, Part 1, Question 86, Article 4, Reply 2. He also believed that we have a weak natural ability to remotely influence others, or what we today would call telekinesis, which was his explanation for the evil eye. If you want to hear more about his views on these matters, uh, you can listen to episodes 105 and 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult. And by the way, both St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine are doctors of the church, so they're considered among the sharpest and most respected theologians ever. And thus there is a long history in Christian thought that humans may have weak natural abilities that today we'd call psychic. How early did parapsychologists start suspecting that the information mediums were coming up with might be due to psychic abilities? Right from the beginning. As soon as they started studying them in the 19th century, they said this could be psychic rather than actual departed souls. And it's really impressive for them to have started investigating that hypothesis that early. The idea is that when mediums get accurate information that's beyond random chance, this information doesn't have to be coming from departed human souls or from spirits of some other kind like demons. After all, the medium is having an experience that's supposed to involve mind-to-mind -mind contact with a spirit which would be telepathy. So, okay, if telepathy exists, how do we know that she's not telepathically picking up the information from one of the sitters and then mistakenly interpreting it as coming from a departed soul because she believes that she's in contact with departed souls? For example, suppose a 19th century parapsychologist is at a sitting and wants to test the medium. He might ask her, what's the name of my dead brother? Can you contact his spirit and ask him something only he and I would know about, like maybe something that happened when we were children? And suppose the medium does come up with the name of the brother and an otherwise unknowable incident from childhood. How should that be interpreted? Has she telepathically gotten the information from the mind of the departed brother? or has she 
telepathically gotten the information from the mind of the parapsychologist sitting right in front of her. Now you can see how it could be interpreted either way. In fact, you could argue it might be easier to get information telepathically from someone right in front of you compared to reaching into the afterlife, finding the right spirit somehow, and getting it from his mind. Is there a name for this hypothesis? Today, this idea is known as the Super Psi Hypothesis, PSI for psychic abilities. The idea is that psychic abilities like telepathy can be functioning in our lives in ways we don't notice. In this case, the idea is that the medium was telepathically getting the information from the sitter without realizing it. Another possibility is that she could be unwittingly remote viewing the past and getting the information that way without telepathy, since remote viewing is thought to be different than telepathy. But there's also another version of the super psi hypothesis. As far as I know, they didn't think of this one in the 19th century, but it's definitely talked about in parapsychological fields today. It's called the experimenter effect. And the idea is that maybe it isn't the medium who's unwittingly doing something psychic. Maybe it's the experimenter. I mean, for example, when the parapsychologist brings to mind the name of his brother and a childhood incident, maybe he's the one doing the telepathic thing. Maybe he's transmitting that information into the mind of the medium, and she assumes it's contact with a spirit since they're both thinking about getting the information from a departed spirit. So if psychic abilities exist, there could be multiple alternative explanations apart from actual contact with the dead. I suppose if you get into parapsychological research, you might be someone who unknowingly has an innate uh, parapsychological ability. Indeed, and this is this is proposed as a possible explanation for why some experimenters get much more significant results than others. Maybe they're the better psychics. Interesting. So did 19th century parapsychologists do anything to try to test this idea and see if they could eliminate the super psi hypothesis? They did. In fact, they did several things. One was holding what are known as proxy sittings. The idea here is that the parapsychologist who was attending the seance wasn't the real sitter. Instead, he was a proxy for another person who was not present. An example would be a proxy sitting experiment that was done by the American Unitarian minister and psychic researcher, Reverend Minot Savage. He did it on the famous American medium, Lenora Piper. Reverend Savage sent his daughter, Miss Savage, as a proxy. And the account of the experiment is very interesting. By the way, in the course of this, he refers to psychometry, which is supposed to be a psychic ability to get information by handling objects. So like if you're given a lock of hair from someone, you could learn about the identity of the person the hair came from. In his 1893 book, Psychics, Facts and Theories, Reverend Savage describes his daughter as a young lady and writes, This young lady is remarkable for her level head, clear thought, and self-control. She and Mrs. Lenora Piper had never met. A sitting was arranged. Miss Savage, my daughter, writing and making the appointment under an assumed name and giving the address of a friend instead of her own home, so anxious was she that there should be no clue to her personality. She carried a book, and in it three envelopes containing three locks of hair. One of these locks was from the head of her mother, but concerning the other two she knew nothing. They had been given her by a friend to be used as a test. When Mrs. Piper had become entranced, Miss Savage gave her one of the envelopes containing a lock of hair. Immediately her control began talking about it. She told whose head it was from, gave the name, and not only this, but the names of other people connected with this one, and described their characteristics and the relations in which they stood to each other. Meantime, Miss Savage was in entire ignorance as to the correctness of the statements being made. She, however, made a careful record of them all, and afterwards found that all which had been said was true in every particular. What happened in regard to this one lock of hair happened concerning them all. In each case, names were given, facts referred to, persons described, and all with complete accuracy. I state the case in this brief and general way, but I have in my possession all the particular facts written out at the time. 
This is really impressive as an experiment. I mean, look how careful the researcher is being. He does not attend the sitting, but he sends his daughter, who the psychic does not know, and she goes under an assumed name using a fake address, meaning it's hard for Mrs. Piper to do a hot reading on her. The daughter gives her unlabeled envelopes with locks of hair from people who are not present, and the daughter only knows who one of those locks of hair came from, so Mrs. Piper can't pick up any information about the other two telepathically from the daughter. What they're trying to do is set up a double-blind experiment where neither the medium nor the sitter has the information that's going to be asked about. Yet Mrs. Piper is able to correctly name and describe the owners of each of the locks of hair as well as other people connected with each of them, and all the information turns out to be accurate. And because the daughter doesn't have most of the information in question, it couldn't telepathically be read out of her mind which could be taken as meaning that it came from a spirit, in this case, Miss Piper's control or spirit guide. You say could be taken that way. Do the advocates of the super psi hypothesis have an alternative explanation? Yeah, just because the daughter doesn't have the information doesn't mean that it couldn't be picked up telepathically. If telepathy exists, we know so little about how it works that we don't know its range, if it even has one. So even though the daughter didn't have the information, the friend who provided the other two locks of hair had the information about who they came from, and Mrs. Piper could have read it out of her mind. Uh, she could have subconsciously learned from the daughter's mind who had given her the locks of hair and then just jumped to that person and read their mind about the locks of hair. There's actually a parallel to this in remote viewing. Back when the government was conducting its psychic spying research, the remote viewers would be given a set of coordinates to identify a target that they were then asked to get impressions of. What they found is that the coordinates could be completely arbitrary, just a random number. So you could tell a viewer, please describe target 12345678. And he'd be able to do it, even though both he and his monitor were blind to what was at the target. As long as somebody knew what the target was supposed to be, the made-up number would work. And the viewer was presumably telepathically picking up the connection between the arbitrary target number and the actual target. So super psi advocates argue that something similar could be happening in this case. As long as somebody knew the connection between the locks of hair and the people they came from, Mrs. Piper might have been able to either establish telepathic contact or remotely view the people in question. It doesn't sound like proxy sittings are regarded as a particularly good way to eliminate the super psi hypothesis then. No, and for that reason, more recent parapsychologists have tried to come up with even more subtle tests to try to distinguish between super psi and the idea that this information is coming from a departed human being. How do those tests work? By making sure that nobody who is alive has the information. In 1946, a researcher named Thulis proposed a cipher test. In the fifth edition of the textbook An Introduction to Parapsychology, it states, This entails a passage of prose translated into code. The passage can be deciphered only by use of a key word or phrase that is known solely by the person who designs the code. During the lifetime of that person, others are invited to use either ESP or cryptographic techniques to discover the key and thereby decipher the passage. If they are unable to do so, and an alleged post-mortem communication from the spirit of the test designer conveys the correct key to a medium, the notion of survival may be held to be supported. Researchers had a long wait for the opportunity to enact Thulis's own instances of the cipher test. Having published his coded passages in 1946, Thulis died in 1984 at the age of 90, 38 years later. The Society for Psychical Research and another group immediately invited people, presumably with the aid of Thulis's discarnate personality, to nominate the clue that would decode the sequences. For several years, no effective solution was forthcoming. But then, in 1996, it was announced that the words Black Beauty 
had been shown to be the cipher for one of Thulis's passages. The decoded passage read, This is a cipher which will not be read unless I give the key words. So now they knew what Thulis's encrypted message said. Unfortunately, the way it was ultimately cracked had nothing to do with a discarnate spirit. Instead, the Black Beauty solution was discovered by a cryptographic expert using a computer. And this points out a fundamental problem with tests of this nature. They can be solved by simple code breaking long after the person in question is dead. Just recently, one of the most famous ciphers of the Zodiac Killer, who we will be discussing in a future episode, was solved. Back in November of 1969, the Zodiac Killer released a cipher that was 340 characters long, so it's known as the Zodiac 340 cipher. It wasn't cracked until December of 2020, 51 years later and almost certainly after the Zodiac Killer was dead. But, like in Thulis's experiment, it was solved using computers, which make cipher breaking much easier than it used to be. So there's nothing in principle that would stop a modern medium from breaking a cipher through purely natural means, but claiming it as a paranormal hit. Or, if psychic abilities exist, breaking it another way, like remotely viewing the encryption when the cipher was initially encoded. Now, others have proposed additional tests but so far, nobody has developed a test that would definitively distinguish between the super psi hypothesis and the survival hypothesis. So beyond random chance, info could be coming either from psychic sources, if they exist, or from departed human souls. And nobody's figured out a way to distinguish between these two possibilities. Neither have they figured out a way to distinguish those hypotheses from the idea that the information comes from a third source, demons. What do you think about the possibility that such information could be coming from demons? I think it has to be taken seriously. Now, as longtime listeners of the show know, I am not one to leap to the demon hypothesis automatically. But this is a case where I think we do have to look at it. My starting assumption is that every phenomenon should be taken at face value until we have evidence to the contrary. As a result, it's a mistake to leap to the conclusion that any strange phenomenon must be demons. In fact, leaping to that conclusion will cause scorn to be heaped on the Christian faith by making Christians look paranoid and superstitious where everything mysterious has to be attributed to evil spirits. But in this case, I think we have to take the possibility seriously. Speaking from the viewpoint of Christian faith, we know that demons exist, and so Unlike secularists, we can't simply dismiss the idea that the mediums are sometimes in touch with demonic spirits. And this is a challenge for mediums also. They need to be asked, well, how do you know all the spirits you're talking to are human spirits? Why couldn't God create purely spiritual beings like angels? And why couldn't some of these angels have turned to the dark side? I mean, we can't eliminate those possibilities without evidence. And even in this life, we insist on seeing people's ID cards. So how can a medium know that a given spirit is really who it claims to be and not another spirit, possibly a demonic one, that's impersonating the target? Combined with that, from uh, the Christian perspective again, we have to recognize that this is a forbidden practice, which suggests that there's something dangerous about it. And in 1 John 4... St. John warns us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we shouldn't believe every spirit, and we need to test them. And in 2 Corinthians 11, St. Paul warns us that the devil himself masquerades as an angel of light, so one of his cronies could certainly masquerade as a sitter's dead brother. How could we test a spirit a medium is talking to to see if it's a demon? One way is by asking theological questions and seeing if the spirit makes claims that are contrary to the Christian faith or encourages you to do something that's contrary to the Christian faith. In those cases, that would be evidence that a particular spirit is a demon, at least from a Christian point of view. We have to be careful, though, because demons sometimes report information 
that's in harmony with the Christian faith. In Acts 16, Luke writes, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by soothsaying. She followed Paul and us, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul was annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. What it says in Greek is that the slave girl has a spirit of python. Python being a serpent or dragon that protected the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, at least until Apollo killed Python. So this girl was recognized in the Greek culture of the day as being in touch with spirits that would let her predict the future. She was, in other words, a medium. And the spirit that she had in her was demonic because she's possessed and Paul has to exorcise her. But notice what a weird demon this is. Instead of trying to draw people away from the Christian faith, it's actually telling people that Paul and his companions are servants of the Most High God and will announce the way of salvation to them. That's supporting the gospel rather than subverting it. Why would a demon do something like that? Who can say? I mean, perhaps it was hoping to avoid being exorcised by Paul by pretending to be a friendly and supportive spirit. Or perhaps it was playing a long game where the subversion of the gospel would only come later on, or maybe it had some other motive. In any event, it illustrates that we can't assume that something is not a demon just because it says good stuff. In this case, the spirit was not pretending to be a human one. It was a spirit of Python. And the fact that it was possessing a girl allowed Paul to infer that it was a demon. But the matter is more complicated if a spirit presents itself as human. Are there any possible scenarios where a medium might be getting information from departed human souls? I think we have to say that there are because we have the case of the medium of Endor contacting the deceased prophet Samuel. That shows that God allows this to take place in at least some circumstances. Of course, this was forbidden and it didn't go well for Saul, so I can imagine that in some cases God might let a medium get in contact with the departed soul, particularly if the departed soul warns against coming to the medium again. Also, I'd note that in the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas Aquinas held that it's possible for God to allow even the damned to appear to the living. He wrote, It is also credible that this may occur sometimes to the damned and that for man's instruction and intimidation, they be permitted to appear to the living. And that's in the supplement to the third part, question 69, article 3, if you want to look it up. The reasons that St. Thomas gives for why God might allow a damned soul to have contact with the living are for the instruction and intimidation of the living. In other words, encouraging them to get back on the straight and narrow. God could certainly allow a medium to contact a damned soul for those purposes. However, the list that St. Thomas gives may not be exhaustive. And since God allows demonic spirits to interact with mediums to deceive humans, I can't rule out the possibility that he might allow the souls of the damned to just do the same thing. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on mediumship? I think that when it comes to mediumship, the explanation of the phenomenon is all of the above. Much of the time, mediums report incorrect information or information that happens to be right through random chance. In other situations, they report accurate information through purely natural means. Some mediums are deliberate con artists who use techniques from stage magic, including mentalism tricks like hot and cold readings. Others are committing unintentional fraud, such as when they subconsciously pick up on clues from the sitters and think that the information is coming from the spirits instead. Yet, there also is at least some scientific evidence that certain mediums may be able to get information in a paranormal way, If psychic powers exist, some of that information might be coming from things like telepathy or remote viewing. 
However, also in the paranormal world, demons definitely exist, and some of the information is coming from demons, as with the slave girl that St. Paul encountered. And in some cases, God may allow contact with a human soul, as in the case of the prophet Samuel. Nevertheless, don't do this. It is forbidden in the Bible, and the church has consistently taught against it for the past 2,000 years. It's dangerous, so stay away from it. Jimmy, you wanted to come back to the faith perspective after we covered the reason perspective. What did you want to say? I wanted to discuss the reason that the Bible forbids us to use mediums. I mean, when God gives a command, there's a reason for it. He doesn't just command things arbitrarily. The ultimate purpose behind all of God's commands is to make us happy in the long run. So why would consulting mediums not make us happy in the long run? I think it's because of all the problems we've just covered. Lots of time the information is not accurate and should not be relied upon. When it is accurate, it's very often because of either deliberate or unconscious fraud that's being committed. And when a medium is in contact with a spirit, the medium doesn't really know whether it's a human spirit or a demon that's out to harm people, either in the short run or the long run. Thus, it makes sense for God to forbid this practice. It's unreliable, frequently misleading, and even dangerous. It does not promote our welfare. Jimmy, that was an excellent and comprehensive look at the topic of mediumship, but I'm surprised and a little disappointed you didn't include the story about the short medium who was being sought by police. You know, the small medium at large? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, if you think if you think about Lenora Piper, I mean, she was a woman and mm-hmm. so smaller than some of the men who were researching her. And she yeah. was a medium and she went both. She was studied both in America and in England. So she, you could call her a small medium at large. <laughs> Sorry, folks, we have all the dad jokes here. So let's uh, finish up this topic by talking about the further resources we have to offer to the listener. We'll have a link to Deborah Blum's book, Ghost Hunters, William James and the Scientific Search for Proof of Life After Death, which is a fascinating read. We'll also have a link to the textbook, Parapsychology, a handbook for the 21st century, which is massive and covers all kinds of different parapsychological subjects. We'll also have a link to the textbook, An Introduction to Parapsychology, 5th edition, which is a shorter textbook that covers many of the same subjects. We'll also have Father Alois Weisinger's book, Occult Phenomena in Light of Theology, Reverend Minot Savage's book, Psychics, Facts, and Theories, and then we'll have some articles. Uh, Obviously, we'll have one on mediumship, another on Rayleigh scattering, which is actually a video that shows you how Rayleigh scattering works, so why the sky is blue visually. We'll have articles on hot and cold reading, and on unconscious fraud. And then we'll have a link to that Bichel and Schwartz 2007 mediumship study that was quintuple blinded that we talked about earlier. And so you can look at all the statistics and things like that from there and get more information about it generally. Excellent. As promised, we have mysterious feedback this time on the recent episode we did on Carlos Castaneda, the godfather of the new age. And our first feedback comes from Francesco on Patreon, who writes, I am a physicist. And often, and to my amusement and or irritation, I read many times about New Age theories where they use the concept of energy and fields in absurd and nonsensical ways. I wonder, was Castaneda the first to hijack modern scientific concepts to expound dubious spiritual beliefs? Seeing the the popularity of his book, he does seem to have had a major impact on the New Age scene view of modern sciences. Regarding fraud in academia, it's unfortunately rather common. I work as a researcher in physics for a university, and even in the hard sciences, there's a lot of fraud and plagiarism going on. High-profile cases that get press attention, like H. Sean in 2002, are just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, fraud and ideological hijacking in academia could be a Mysterious World episode in itself. Oh, and will be. We're going to have an upcoming episode on the crisis in science, including the replication crisis and the problem of fraud and things like that. So that's definitely coming up. In terms of Castaneda hijacking scientific terminology, he definitely wasn't the first. Because science has become such a a dominant paradigm in our culture since the scientific revolution, people try to, from every field, 
try in various ways to link their concepts to science because of the high prestige that science has. And uh, so as soon as a scientific term enters into popular use, you're going to find people using it in connection with parapsychology or other things. I mean, you'll have, for example, you see this in other fields entirely innocently, like where you'll have people try to explain the mind in terms of a computer with hardware and software. And in some ways, that's a helpful metaphor, but in others, it's not. Earlier in the 20th century, after Marconi developed radio, parapsychologists would sometimes talk about telepathy as mental radio. And they even thought maybe that's actually what it is. Maybe telepathic messages are transmitted on uh, via radio waves. Uh, they ultimately were able to show it's not that, or at least not in any clear, straightforward way. Your your mind does, your brain does not work like a radio set in that way. But um, it was uh, an analogy that they found helpful up to a point, and then further research helped clarify the extent to which it was or was not accurate. But it, you know, does involve telepathy like radio does involve transmitting signals over a distance or at least is perceived to be doing that. But no, you'll have people from every different field try to grab concepts from science and relate them to their own field, including New Agers like Carlos Castaneda. Wonder writes on YouTube, I took mescaline once that I got from a co-worker who used it often. She called in sick every Monday. I was a very impressionable 18-year-old girl in 1971. It was frightening. I saw a ferocious tiger coming at me, and the walls were breathing patterns. Never again. Oh, boy, that sounds scary. And, yeah, good warning. Stay away from, stay away from drugs, folks. The thought of the walls breathing patterns, I actually have a bit of an image of what that's like, not because I've taken mescaline, because I never have, but there's a movie that came out in 1963. It's a black and white movie called The Haunting, and it's about a haunted house and these people who are staying in it. But wow, there are some terrifying <laughs> sequences in it. There's one sequence where you have these two women who are in a bedroom. They're hunkered down together because of all the phenomena happening in the house. And it's night and they start hearing this weird clanking, rattling noise coming down the hallway. And it's unidentifiable. It sounds vaguely mechanical, but there's no way to identify it. It's like, what is that noise? And when it gets up to their door their door starts warping in and out and <laughs> pulsating like it's breathing, even though this is a big, thick wooden door. And it's like, what on earth could be causing that? And it's so terrifying. So I have sympathy with your walls doing breathing patterns, uh, horror image. I've seen something like that on the movie screen. It makes you wonder how many reports of hauntings have to do with intentional or unintentional drug use. Yeah, or how many filmmakers take drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have more evidence on that one. Robert Leonard on YouTube writes, the Yaqui in Arizona are for the most part staunchly Catholic with some folk devotions. Their presence in America is from long-term persecution by the Mexican political hierarchy. Thank you. I hadn't been aware that the persecution in Mexico had been what was responsible for many of them relocating to the southwestern United States. But thank you very much for the information. Erin Carter writes on YouTube, My dad said he started one of Castaneda's books, got in 25 pages, and said it was a load of bunk. My dad will read just about anything and usually gives everyone time to make their points. I appreciate that. I try to do the same thing, but sometimes it's just too much, and I decide I have other better uses of my time. <laughs> so, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? We have a theme of decoding old things. Since we mentioned the cracking of the Zodiac cipher last month, the Zodiac 340 cipher, we'll have a link to an article on that so you can read about it and find out what it was said. And embedded in the article is a YouTube video from a channel on YouTube that has been trying to crack Zodiac's codes. And I had actually been a follower of that channel for, for a while. And I'd watched the initial four videos and then where they were trying to make progress towards cracking this one. And then the fifth video, wham, after 51 years, they've suddenly done it. Mm. So you can check that out and watch the video to see how the code worked. Turns out one of the reasons it was so hard to crack is Zodiac made a mistake partway through the encoding process. 
And it wasn't until they identified his mistake that it the rest of the text snapped into place. Also, speaking of decoding old things, you know how, you know the constellation, the Pleiades, right? It's up in the sky. It's near Orion, the hunter. And it's a, kind of an open nebula that's facing Earth that has stars in it. And it's called the Seven Sisters. You probably, or many of the readers will have heard it called the Seven Sisters. Well, the thing is, you look at it, you can only see six. Hmm. What happened to the Seventh Sister? And it's not just in European culture that it's called the Seven Sisters. It's called the Seven Sisters all over the world, in the Americas, among Native peoples in the Americas, and among Australian Aborigines. Everybody thinks of this as the Seven Sisters, even though we can only see six. And they have a legend to explain why, and the legends differ, but they have a legend to explain what happened to the seventh sister, like she's in hiding or something like that. Now, the idea is Orion is a hunter who is hunting the sisters, or he's a group of young men that are hunting the sisters. And so one of the sisters is either too young or got married or is in hiding or something like that. But we'll have a link to a paper that proposes an explanation for all of this. Now, I've mentioned before, I think, on the show how we have evidence that the constellation Ursa Major or the Great Bear is a constellation that goes back at least 15,000 years. The traditions, because we have historical traditions on both sides of the Bering Strait that connect it this way. And so it looks like the identification of the Great Bear goes back at least 15,000 years. Well, it looks like the identification of the Pleiades as the Seven Sisters goes back 100,000 years. Because 100,000 years ago, there was another star that was visible there that then, because of the proper motion of the stars, moved so close to another that they can no longer be distinguished. Mm. And so it looks like there are were seven, but now there are only six visible because the star has moved. And that is likely, or according to this paper, the explanation of why cultures all over the world speak of the Pleiades as the seven sisters, and then they have an explanation for why you can only see six. And this tradition of identifying them as the seven sisters may therefore go back a 100,000 years. Wow. Fascinating. All right, let's wrap things up there. Uh, That's it from us. What do you think? What are your theories about mediums and speaking with the dead? We want to hear your feedback. Uh, You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Folks, remember to share the podcast with your friends. We greatly appreciate that. We, we see you do that all the time on social media. And that really helps us grow the audience and reach new, uh, new audiences and new people who can benefit from the show. So we really appreciate that. Also, when you write a review in Apple Podcasts or another directory, that also helps us a huge deal. And we love to get your reviews and love to see your feedback there. So we really do appreciate that. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>